Dave Swift, how are you, man? I'm very well, thank you. How about you? I'm very good. I'm very good. Thanks a lot uh, on this Monday morning to agree to to be on this uh, nice interview. Uh, you're welcome. I'm very, very glad to be here. <laughs> awesome. So obviously, you know, for the ones who don't know, Dave uh, is the resident bassist uh, and trombonist for uh, the Jules Holland uh, um, Late Show. And uh, of course, he's, uh, on top of being uh, that, he's also a freelancer and doing a lot of gigs around and sessions player. So today I hope uh, we're going to have a very nice uh, um, chat about uh, what it is to be a professional musician and bassist. And uh, thanks again for, uh, for being here with us. My pleasure. <laughs> so I wanted to start uh, at the very beginning. How did you get into music? And uh, I know that you started playing euphonium at the very start of your career. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think music, it goes further back than that for me, because when I was a kid, my, my, you know, there was music in the house. My two brothers played guitar in the house uh, and a bit of piano. And they, they're older than I am. They're eight and 11 years older than me. So they were playing records uh, of their own. So from my brother's rooms, I was hearing Joni Mitchell, Cream, Jimi Hendrix, that kind of thing. And then my parents used to love watching like musicals on TV, you know, with, with things with Judy Garland and Fred Astaire and what, what have you, you know. So even though nobody was professional, there was, there was music in the house. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, I seemingly had a good singing voice. So I always used to get picked for school choirs <laughs> for, for singing those. And then when I was 10, I joined my local church choir. Uh, which I stayed in for about nine or ten years, and that was regular singing every Sunday and choir practice and what have you. And I and I loved it, you know. So music was was always there, but um, I wasn't playing an instrument when I was when I was young, and I didn't I didn't imagine I would be. I didn't have a deep calling to actually play something, and it wasn't. And I tried my brother's guitars. I did have a go on them. And the, and the piano, but nothing really reached out to me. So it wasn't until I went to secondary school and I really wanted to play the saxophone because I'd seen one on TV and it looked really cool. Uh, the school didn't have one and I wanted a trombone and they gave that to somebody else. So I ended up with a euphonium, uh, which for people who don't know, it's like a mini tuba. And, um, and I liked it, but it wasn't the instrument of my choice. So I didn't play it for very long. But eventually I did get to play the trombone at school, I did get to choose my desired instrument. And I played some tuba as well, but trombone was the, was the main instrument. And, uh, and I had a teacher at the school who would be a visiting peripatetic teacher. He came every week. But I, I, didn't, I didn't start playing the trombone until quite late. I was 14. In fact, he didn't almost take me on because of how old I was. Normally, they only give instruments to kids that are much younger. But thankfully, he, he saw some potential in me and he saw my passion. Uh, you know, he could see that I was going to make progress quite quickly. So he took me on. So I became his, his trombone pupil uh, and, and playing some tuba as well. But then we formed a school band and we needed a bass player. So I don't know why, still to this day, I've no idea why I volunteered. But I put my hand up and said, well, I'll do it. <laughs> and then I went out and got a bass guitar with my eldest brother. He, he came shopping with me and we bought a bass guitar, a really cheap one. And uh, uh, it was a K, it was a Fender Precision Copy K bass. It weighed a ton. It was heavier than the sun, this thing was. It, it just <laughs> killed my back, uh, even at that age. But then my trombone teacher, when he saw me playing bass guitar at school as well, he said, you know, you should take up um, double bass. Because if you do that, if you decide to become a professional musician, you'll get much more work if you play both instruments. So that's what happened. Like a, a few weeks later, I got a double bass as well. And I was, so, I was, so at school, I was playing trombone, tuba, bass guitar, and double bass. <laughs> but as a bass player, I was self-taught. I was only having lessons on the brass instruments. Ah. Uh, so as a bass player, I was, because I couldn't find a teacher anywhere. I bought a couple <laughs> of books, um, but you know, fundamentally, I was self-taught on the bass. That's pretty cool, man. Mm. So do you think that um, the, the music theory that you learned from, uh, from the brass helped you a lot with your bass playing or uh, 
you almost had two different uh, compartments when playing no, no, the different I mean, instruments. It, it helped immeasurably because, well, the great thing about the the, the trombone and the uh, you know the tuba and the euphonium, I had to read music from day one. Mm. You know, if you study these instruments in secondary school, you you can't just say I don't want to read, I just want to play. It wasn't like that. It was very regimented. You know, you got a certain book that you had to read from certain a number of books. So I didn't really have any choice, but <clears throat> because I'd already sang in a church choir and I'd been following, you know, the harmony of a thing. Mm -hmm. So actually reading music for me was never a problem. I, I didn't have any pro issue with it at all. So by the time I came to play bass, my reading was already such of a high standard because on trombone as well, it's such a wide range, the instrument. Um, <clears throat> but from, I had to learn to play four different clefs. I had to play treble clef in, in brass bands and then mostly bass clef elsewhere, but you had to learn tenor and alto clef. So, you know, that's a lot of stuff going on there. So, <clears throat> and also a lot of the trombone parts I was playing, because I was playing in, um, in, in orchestras, in wind bands, concert bands, pop bands, funk bands, uh, uh, jazz, big band stuff. So a lot of the stuff I was playing on trombone was, was way more complicated than I ever had to play on the bass. Hmm. <clears throat> so really, it was, a, it was a huge help. It was a huge help. And for instance, something like the trombone as well, because there's no set positions on the slide. And it's similar, you know, with a double bass. There are no, there are no position markers. You know, you, 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 um, you play by using muscle memory and your ears. It helped with the tuning, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, so, and, and so the whole intonation thing from, from going from trombone to double bass and fretless bass was a huge asset. It was huge. The only, the only thing was I wasn't studying music as an academic subject. So in other words, everything I was learning about music was from the brass instruments. I wasn't <clears throat> learning about harmony because I wasn't okay. playing a chordal instrument. I wasn't playing piano. I wasn't playing guitar. So that was the only... <clears throat> that was the only thing about those instruments that, you know, I, I wasn't learning. I was learning about theory and about reading and about the instruments themselves. But, but harmony, I wasn't studying. But it wasn't a problem back then because everything I had to play was written down. It was very rare that I was given any chords. It was always written notation. So as long as your reading was good, there wasn't a problem. You know, so yeah. the, the study of harmony didn't come till much later on. Uh, in in life, you know, um, but yeah, at, at the very beginning, you know, playing other instruments was a huge asset, and I think as well, you know, because you know something like a trombone, I was playing very melodic things, <clears throat> and most people who just take up the bass, and that's their first instrument, they just play bass lines from day one, which is fine, but I just found that playing other instruments helps, you know, in, in a lot of other ways, like. Um, like particularly melodically. I mean, some of my favorite bass players in the world uh, were played other instruments before they became bass players. They often played like sax or trumpet or whatever, you know. So I, I think it, it's, it was a huge benefit to me, I felt, personally. Well, I guess if you think about it, bass lines are melodies, after all. <clears throat> Just in the bass uh, register, right? Yeah. Well, especially if you if you listen to people like James Jameson, you know the great Motown bassist, because his bass lines on those Motown hits are, are just outrageous. They're they're so melodic. They are they're solos in themselves, but without getting yeah. in the way of the music. So he was, but he he actually played double bass before he played bass guitar. But he was a jazz musician. Do you know what I mean? So I think that he he took a lot from. The world of jazz, you know, the, the, the harmonic content, the improvisation side of it, and you yeah. put that onto the bass guitar. So, uh, you know, had he have maybe not have been a jazz double bass player, he wouldn't have been as creative when he switched to the to the bass guitar. Who knows, you know? But um, yeah, but yeah, it was it was definite advantage for me. I, I just wish that I'd studied, say, piano when I was when I was younger, because I think. I think every musician, as well as every non-piano player, should have some piano skills. Yes, you know, I just agree. Really I always like, say it to drummers as well. Yeah, absolutely, because it really opens your mind up to to harmony in particular. You know, yeah. uh, or, and even guitar as well is, is still a great. I mean, I play guitar now, 
with the piano, I've tried and I haven't really bonded with it. My seven-year-old son plays piano. He has lessons and he's, he's the best piano player in the house. <laughs> so, um, so for him, you know, he's going he's gonna to have that understanding of harmony and theory so early on, like way, way before I did. So I'm quite envious of him. You know, but, um... Are you already playing together? <laughs> not, not, not on gigs, I guess. <laughs> but <laughs> right. he, he was practicing the other day, and I did. I, I had my tuba out, and and I was I was playing along with him, you know, playing some bass lines. But uh, I, I don't think he was too pleased with it. I think he. Uh, <laughs> I think yeah. I think I'll have to wait a while longer before he appreciates what I'm trying to do, you know. But yeah, I mean, my wife Lucy, she's a professional jazz singer. And she actually plays, she can play some piano um, and she's helping him with his studies, but she plays banjo. So the point is, at, su at some stage, you know, I'm going to get the tuba out, she's going to get the banjo, do some singing and Oscar on the piano and hopefully we'll, we'll have a little family trio there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I know, I, I remember seeing some of your posts, because obviously we've been, uh, I've been following you online for a few years. Um, is, am I correct to remember that you, before starting your career uh, uh, in, in London, uh, you were uh, on cruise ships? Am I... Yeah. yeah. How, like, was it, like, was it a good experience for you? Like, uh, how, would you say it was a good school in terms of uh, musicianship? Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, well, it was, I think it was the better school in life mm. uh, than, than, <laughs> than musicianship. Uh, I mean, it was good because the, I, I did four cruise ships. In the, in the mid 80s, from 1984 to 1988, I did four different ships. I did the QE2, I did the Cunard uh, Countess Princess, and I did a world cruise on the Canberra, I think at the end of it, you know. Uh, so the first two ships, I was with a band that I, I wasn't in, you know, I, in other words, I got hired to join this, this band. So I hadn't worked with the guys before on the first two ships. But the good thing was it was all reading. Stuff. It was yeah. everything was written out. There were charts, so all I had to do was to get on the ship and just play what was put in front of me. And you had to back the artists that were that were on the ship as well. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that. So I was twenty when I first went on those ships. So you know, I was I was playing like a lot of dance music, like you know, just for people to dance around the ballroom. Too. But these were actually kind of like jazz standards. They were they were proper songs like that but um but they were for people to dance to they weren't really listening to them you know but then yeah back in the artists and the artists would come in with their own charts so you'd have to be able to sight read that stuff uh and then later ships i played on i played with a, a set band that i was i was part of and uh, and yeah you know we we got to play like a lot of stuff but, um but really it was it was more the the life the life lessons that you learn. I mean, obviously, we were traveling all over the world. We got to see places that we could never have dreamt of going uh, on our own. So we were visiting different countries, seeing different cultures, different food. So really, it was, it was more a, of an education in, in life than it was a musical thing. Because again, everything was, was written down. I wasn't playing in a, in a particularly creative setting and I wasn't improvising with musicians. It was always reading everything. And, and it's yeah. great for that because, you know, my, my reading ability was as, as, as good as it could be, you know, so I was, I was grateful of that, but it was, um, yeah, it was much more a lesson in, in, you know, mixing with other people, you know, social settings, you know, learning just how to be around people from, uh, you, you know, from different towns, different countries, different cultures. It was much more a thing for that. But yeah, I, I, I loved it, especially going to America. First time I went to New York and uh, I'd never been to America. I'd never been to New York before. And it was just amazing. It was still the most exciting place I think I've ever been to. I remember going into a very famous shop called Manny's in New York and everybody wanted the real book. Uh, you know, the book with all the jazz tunes. And yeah. Um, but at, at the time, it was still illegal, I think, you know, they hadn't... Illegal? Of, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, it used to be called the fake book. And maybe it was called the fake book then. And what had happened is people had printed all of these charts and songs yeah. without getting the permission from the people that wrote them. I see. <laughs> it used to be called the fake book originally, and it was illegal. And so in the shop, they, they sold these things in there, but you had to kind of say, <laughs> you know, 
have you got a copy of the uh, <coughs> the <coughs> <laughs> and literally they would they would they would go behind the counter they would put it in a brown paper bag and they would put it under <laughs> the counter and you'd have to give them the money like like <laughs> I'll see you in that alley at five five or five p.m. <laughs> yeah, it was the weirdest thing, but obviously it was a great book because it just meant that you you know you could access all of the the tunes and stuff. But it was just funny that how how back then it was um, yeah it uh, it wasn't like uh, like now you can just buy these things and they're all yeah. legit. Back then it wasn't. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. <laughs> they, were, they were great. They, they, they were they were amazing. But um, you know you had to be careful as well because the. The things that that you that you are, um, you know, you have to be careful with watching what you do, you know, because obviously you can get in trouble on the ships, you can get thrown off the ships if you drink too much, if you don't pay your bar <laughs> bill, um, yeah. you know, if you get caught with substances that you're not supposed to be uh, possessing, you know. So you know, you have to be careful as well. I, I, I you know, it was. Uh, yeah, you had to be quite responsible, is what I'm saying. So you, you risked that to be fired because of the fake book then? <laughs> uh, no, 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 thankfully not. Thankfully I wasn't fired for that. <laughs> but um, I, I think the, the only thing about the cruise ships, and, and I love them, like I said, I, I, um, they were just amazing. Some of the best times I've had and made, made very good friends. But I think you have to be careful because career-wise, if, if you just do those and nothing else, then people forget who you are back home. You know, they, they ring your yes. number and you're away all the time. Um, and it's, and, and some, I know some guys that basically lived on there, some of the musicians, because they didn't want to do anything else. They, they didn't have, you know, with, with the greatest of respect, they, they didn't have a huge amount of ambition. Hmm. You know, they were glad that they could play an instrument. They were glad they were getting, earning money and they were traveling the world all the time. So they thought, some of them thought to themselves, why change this? This is a great life, you know? Yeah. But I think for me, um, as much as I love doing that, you know, I had other ambitions and I wanted to improve as a musician. I wanted to play with different people. I wanted to play more creative music with creative musicians. So I just knew that it was something that you couldn't just keep doing. At some point you had to, you had to say, yeah. okay, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. So, but I did it for on and off, not constantly, but I did it on and off for four years. And it was great, it was great fun. Yeah. And how did you make the transition then back to land? Like, um, what, what were the first steps that you took when you, when you came back from the ship? And uh, what was your first gig? Well, what happened is, it, it, so in between coming, you know, coming off the cruise ships, other things were, were coming in, like other freelance work. I mean, when I, when I came home from the QE2, uh, you know, I was living with my parents in my hometown of Wolverhampton. So I was 20, 19 or 20 in there. Straight away, they said to me, "It was someone has called up, uh, and they want they want you to play in a band in the Middle East, um, in the United Arab Emirates, for ten uh. weeks." And it was a, a hotel gig, and it was a similar kind of thing. You know, it was a band that there was a big pad, the charts were all there. You just had to read it, and it was ten weeks playing in this hotel. People would come, and you know, you would back singers and stuff like that. So. You know, and you do that, and then by the time you get home, you know, the phone would call again, and someone would say, "Oh, can you? There's another cruise ship. We want you on." So it was, it was just. I mean, back in those days, it was great because the difference between now is back then there was there seemed to be a lot of work, like loads and loads of work all the time, but there weren't that many musicians. Hmm. You know, I mean, there were a lot, but it was. There was always plenty of work to go around, whereas I think now it's, it's changed greatly in the fact that there's musicians everywhere. You know, yeah. there, there's more and more people have learned to, to, to play an instrument. More people want to be a professional player or an artist, whatever. And the work has, has diminished. You know, there isn't, there isn't the volume of work there, you know, and especially with recessions and, and um, uh, you know, things with COVID and stuff, you know, venues closing down. Uh, you know, they're not having live music or they're just having a duo or whatever kind of thing. So it's a very different, it's a very different time now, you know. So back then it was literally, you come off a ship, you'd get like, uh, and you know, like things like summer seasons, you know, like I, I, I did, I did summer seasons as well. I did a couple of those kind of things. So then there was mm -hmm. never a shortage of work. You know, you yeah. never had to worry that the phone wouldn't ring you and you never had to call somebody up. It just it just kept happening, you know. But at the same time, the work I was doing again wasn't very um, creative. 
Yeah, I you know, Because I, I was playing all of this pop stuff. Um, I mean, the irony is I, I was playing all of these songs by like Lionel Richie, uh, you know, and George Benson uh, and what have you, not realizing that further down the line, I'm going to be actually playing with Lionel Richie and with George yeah. Benson. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was... That was the strange thing uh, about it, you know, but... Um, That's pretty insane to think about it, uh, you know, that, that you get to play with your heroes and uh, with people that you always looked up to. Sure. How did the Jules Holland gig come about? What, what, what was the, the process of getting that gig? Okay, so I, I moved to London at the end of 1988. So, so the band I was playing with was still doing the cruise ship things and the summer seasons, and I could have stayed... I could have stayed with that, you know, I could have stayed with that, but I, I just knew that that was not going to further my career. I just knew that mm -hmm. I was going to get stuck in a rut because I was playing all that stuff. And then in my, in my spare time, I'd be listening to weather report and uh, return to forever. Uh, you know, all, all of this kind of fusion and, and mainstream jazz. And I'm thinking, this is what I want to be playing this kind of stuff. So to me, the only option was to, to, to give up on that life you know, doing those kind of gigs. And I used to do a lot of theatre work as well, because my trombone teacher was a fixer in the West Midlands. Uh. And he's still with us, a guy called Phil Johnson. I owe him everything, really. But not only was he my brass teacher, but he, he got me work in, uh, in, in theatres, uh, you know, doing musicals, shows, whatever. But I'd done all of that stuff, and I wanted to get away from, from that. I wanted, again, I wanted to play improvised music. <clears throat> with with better players than me, you know the people always say, the, "How do you get better?" Try and play with people that are better than you are. Uh, yeah. You know, that's, I think that's a great truism. So, so I moved to London in, in '88, thinking that well, this was the best option for me. But it was it was terrifying because I didn't know anybody. <laughs> I didn't know anybody, so I barely had any contact whatsoever. Um, and so, but I just knew I had to do it. So I got to London. Somebody had a spare room in their house, so I was able to, to live there. Um, and then very quickly, I just started to go to gigs. I, I used to go to jam sessions. Went to see everybody and anyone that I could uh, go and watch. And the other key thing is, you know, I, I did some studying with people. Because if you remember, I said that I didn't study, like, harmony uh, yeah. or, 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 or music theory at school very much. So I found certain people, you know, and they're like sort of bass players, like much older guys than me, you know, guys that have been in the industry for forever. So I, I had private lessons with some of these guys. I had lessons in, in harmony and stuff like that with guys that had been to Berkeley School of Music. So I was, I was like this sponge, you know, I was like soaking everything up. I just wanted to be a better player, play with better players, do better gigs. So, and I started to do jazz gigs, but mainly on double bass. I, was, I wasn't playing much bass guitar. And I ended up doing a, um, some gigs with a sax player who was already in Jules' band. Uh, and, and Jules used to use um, Pino Palladino on bass, because Jules and Pino were great friends. And Pino lived in the same area, southeast London. So... So, when, so what happened is that Pino was becoming more and more popular and when he was leaving, Jules said to the guys in the band, we need another bass player. So if you guys know anyone, can you recommend them? So this sax player recommended me and he said, well, you know, he, and he plays double bass as well, which was the appeal for Jules. Yeah. So now I knew who Jules was because I was a big Squeeze fan, which is the pop band that Jules used to be in. So I was, and I had Squeeze Records, so I knew him from that. And he also used to be on a TV show called The Tube in the 80s. And he was a co-host to The Tube with, uh, with Paula Yates. A similar kind of thing to his, his series now later with Jules Holland, but it was mm -hmm. earlier. And he was, he was a kid, he was very young. So I knew who he was, <clears throat> but, but this, is, this is 1991 now. And Jules wasn't the person he is now. He wasn't as famous as he is. He wasn't as high profile. He didn't have his own TV show, radio show. He, he left Squeeze and he was just starting out from, from scratch as a solo artist. So anyway, uh, I, I was asked to go to an audition at his studio, uh, his private studio. So I took my double bass and there was just him and the guitar player, nobody else in the band, no drummer, no, no nothing else. 
And so, you know, I took, I took the bass out and we started to play. And we played for, I don't know, about an hour, just jamming, just, just whatever. I can't remember at all what we played. <clears throat> and I was kind of quite pleased with myself, but I wasn't thinking, I've got to get this gig, you know, I need this gig. Yeah. Because again, Jules, this was 91. So Jules wasn't who he is now and, yeah. and what he is now. So, so I was just kind of, yeah, this is fun. This is fun. And at the end of the audition, Jules said to me, you know, that sounds great, but, but we've got other people to see. Hmm. And, and that to me meant, uh-uh, you know, <laughs> you know it, it's great, but you're not the person we're looking for, you know. Hmm. And I thought to myself, fair enough, I didn't, I wasn't, because I was, I was happy I was in London, I was playing jazz with, with jazz musicians and whatever, I was doing what I wanted to do. So anyway, him and the guitarist went outside. And they must have had a chat for a few minutes. And they came back and Jules said, oh, you know, to hell with it. The gig's yours. You've got the gig. <laughs> so I'm not sure what was, what was said outside, but it must have been quite positive. And then the next thing is he gave me a, a plastic carrier bag that was full of cassette tapes. That's how long ago it was, cassette tapes. <laughs> uh, and it was stuff from, you know, live gigs, mostly with Pino playing some of the stuff had the bass player with squeeze a guy called keith wilkinson he was on some of the stuff but again this was the first time i'd been in a situation where there was no chance you know this was just you know i had to do the work now i had to listen to these and either learn them by ear or write stuff out but it was the first time probably in my life that i'd done something where that someone didn't give me a pad of music and say you've got to read that so so this for me was brilliant because it's what I wanted. I, I, my reading was always very good, but when I was younger, my ears weren't were that well developed. Because that's mm. the thing: if you're reading music all the time and you're not using your ears that much, your ears don't get as well developed as your reading. Yeah. Was. So I had to sort of balance that up. And the Jules thing was very good for me because from day one, I I wasn't given music. I was I was given recording. That's very so that good. Was it, really. So that was 1991, and we started to do gigs. They were very low-key, small venues, colleges, universities, summer balls, all that kind of stuff. But then, a year later, everything changed. Because 1992, he got offered later with Jules Holland, the TV series. Uh, and he was hosting that, and the bands were coming on, and blah, blah, blah. But then all of a sudden we were getting the calls to come and back whoever was coming on the show. And this for me was, I'd never been on TV before. I'd never been on TV and I'd never played with players like George Benson and like Eric Clapton and like B.B. King and this stuff. So it was a real shock to the system. You know, I can right? imagine. I do remember, um, I mean, musically, I think I was prepared. Um, my clothing, I, I look back on some of those early videos and I, my clothes are so terrible. I had no dressing <laughs> at all. You know, some of the stuff I'm wearing, I look as though I've been doing the gardening <laughs> or I've been like under the car, lifting a car or something. I just, because I had no experience with, with TV. I, 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 all I thought was, I've got my instruments, I've learned the songs, that's all I need to do. But yeah. Um, Dress, dress sense wise, I, that's what I'm most embarrassed when I look back at those videos. <laughs> but, that, but that was it really, you know, it was, it was baptism by fire. It yeah. was, and the thing is, and you never get much rehearsal with these people. You, you know, you, uh, sometimes you have to learn the, the song on the day in, in the studio, or occasionally you might get it the night before. But you only get like a couple of run throughs with the artist, like, a few hours before the show, you know, you just run through it a couple of times so they get the camera angles and the lighting. So there was never a lot of time for, for preparation. So that was the other thing. I, I became very good at working very quickly, uh, you know, at learning stuff. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, I always transcribe the bass lines if there's time. I always like, I still like to do that. I mean, obviously, if it's something really simple, you know, I, I like a 12 bar or something, I won't bother, but... Most of the time, I, I will transcribe it because if I'm playing with these people, um, if I'm playing with Shaka Khan, for instance, who I've played with quite a bit over the years, I want to make sure that I've got down what's on the record. 
Because if she turns She's out expecting to be, that. Yeah, because if I've just listened to it casually while I'm driving along, and I turn up to a TV show and I start playing Ain't Nobody, I'm Every Woman, and I'm kind of busking it. I'm kind of going, yeah, you know, that's, that's close enough. And if she turns around to me and she says, Dave, that's, that's not what's on the record, <laughs> then I'm in trouble. I'm in deep trouble. You know? So for me, what I do is when I get the recordings, I transcribe everything, even if it's six pages long, note for note, everything that was played on the original recording. And then I will turn up to rehearsal and I will play that. And if they don't say anything, then it's, then it's fine. But sometimes they will say, you don't have to play what's on the record. You know, sometimes yeah. they will say the opposite. They'll say, just free it up. You know, do more of your own thing. But at least if you've done the preparation in the first place, yeah. I'd rather do it that way around. <laughs> they, they know you can be trusted. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. <laughs> How does a TV gig differ from a regular gig? What, what is uh, the schedule? Uh, you talked a bit about the preparation that you do. Do you have any, any insights on this for, uh, for us who haven't done uh, TV gigs? Well, here's the thing with, with working with Jules. He's quite a unique individual because Jules doesn't like rehearsing much. He, he doesn't enjoy long, lengthy rehearsals. He, he just, like, he's, his attention span is not built that way. You know? so, and I think people are shocked at how little rehearsal we, we have. When we go on tour, we probably have a day rehearsal or, or half a day's rehearsal, and that's it. That's it. You know, some bands have weeks and some bands have months. You know, we have a day or half a day. Now, you know, Jules had a radio show, uh, a Radio 2 show, which, which doesn't go anymore, but it went for like 20 years, and I was the house bassist on that as well. And that was, the, that was quite scary in the fact that we, um, we knew who the guest was going to be, but we, we, we weren't told what song we were going to be playing. <laughs> and I remember kind of thinking, well, you know, surely we need to, this is really important. That's more important than who the guest is. So in the early days of the radio show, and it was just a rhythm section, it wasn't the full band. We would get to the studio and we'd be there, you know, getting set up, warming up, and the guest would turn up. And these guests, and I'm talking about people like Amy Winehouse, Adele, Paul Weller, these kind of people, you know, And what would happen is we're all sitting there and we're saying, oh, hi, you know, great to meet you. What are we doing? Because <laughs> <laughs> the radio show would be mostly uh, an, an interview. It would be mostly Jules and us chatting to them. But then we'd do one song with them in, in the middle of it. Now, the radio show was pre-recorded. But we try and record it in real time. You know, we don't like to stop too much. So, so although, although it doesn't go out live, We're trying to do it like it, like it is. You know. So what would happen is the artist would then say, oh, I'd like to do this song. And then they'd have to get their manager to put a CD on in the control room. And we would have to sit there in front of the artist, listening to the track, kind of going, yeah, yeah, yeah hang on, hang on, Paul. Yeah, just a minute. While the artist Crazy. is sitting there like, <laughs> like <laughs> I mean, talk about pressure. I mean, how nuts is that? You know, I mean, yeah. that's crazy. Um, but the thing is, it, it was it was very high pressure. But what it was, it was great for us because it fought, you know made our ears work overtime. And you know that you can't keep listening over and over and over again to the track. You might you might get two two run throughs of listening to it, and then you've got to be able to play that song with the artist as well as the guys on the album are playing it. You know, so. So that was the worst case scenario of, of, of being under pressure. But as I said, we, but then at a certain point, we turned around to the, the producer and said, listen, can we at least know what the song is the night before? Or the morning of the session while we're having our breakfast, you know, give us, give us a bit more time. And that's what started to happen. But the TV show wasn't quite as bad as that. We, we, would, we would find out the night before, or we would get a cassette the night before or a CD the night before. And then the thing is, not everyone in Jules' band reads music. There's only me and the horn section that can read. So the rest of the rhythm section, the way they would learn stuff is purely by, by ear. Whereas yeah. I will still transcribe everything. I mean, if there's time, I will learn it by ear as well. But yeah. I really enjoy transcribing the parts so I, I know exactly what's on the record. 
So, so I would do that the night before, but when you get to the studio, you would get there, say, four o'clock in the afternoon or half past three. <clears throat> then you would, you, you'd run through the song with just the musicians, and it might be just me and Jules, because sometimes that, that's all they wanted. They just wanted piano and, and bass. Sometimes it would be the rhythm section, sometimes it would be the rhythm section plus a couple of horns, you know. It was, it was never the full band. The only time the full band appear is on the New Year's Eve TV show. Mm. So, so yeah, you'd run through the, the track around about half three, four o'clock, just for us. And then the artist would appear from nowhere and they would sing it with us maybe once or twice. And, and while we're doing this, the, the, the camera people are doing the camera angles, the lighting guys, the sound guys. So everyone's doing a check while we're running the songs. But really, we, we very rarely ran the song through more than a couple of times. And then, yeah. you know, come like half past four, that's it. You stop, and then you have dinner, and then the TV show starts, and then you come out and you, and you play. So it was, you know, there wasn't a lot of preparation. You know, we're talking about still doing it on the day of the, of the show. And sometimes on our New Year's Eve show, the Jules Collins Hootenanny, Sometimes we're still rehearsing two hours before we, we film the show. We're still no way. that close because there's so many people we have to play for, you know. But it's like anything. If, if you do something long enough and often enough, you get very good at it. You get very efficient. Yeah. So, but I remember we, we, did, one, we did one episode of Later when Smokey Robinson was going to be the guest. And it was just the rhythm section and Smokey's MD. But our guitarist couldn't do it. He wasn't available, so Jules got Eric Clapton to come and play. No him. way. So I'm it's a depth. Yeah, it's a depth. <laughs> Eric couldn't get anybody else. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's sitting next to me, and then um, I mean, we were doing that song that Nora Jones had a hit with called "Don't Know Why." That was the that was the track. Yeah. And uh, and we were we were running through it, and then the producer of the show came over and said, "Listen." You know, Smokey Robinson's flight has come in late. You're not going to get time to rehearse with him. You're just going to have to play with him as soon as he walks out onto the studio floor. You know? And I'm kind of thinking, oh boy, oh boy. And, and Eric Clapton was kind of going, what? And, you know, I mean, he just couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. And he said, is this legit? He said, does this happen often to me? And I said, well, I said, I've never, known, I've never known a situation where we've not rehearsed with the artist. You know, we've rehearsed with them at the very last minute, but, we've, but this hasn't happened before. And that's what we did. We, we learnt the song ourselves, and then the show started. Still no sign of Smokey Robinson at all. The show started, <laughs> Jules is introducing all the bands, and I'm still sitting there with Eric kind of thinking, oh, man, I hope he's going to turn up. And then at one point during the show... Jules just Jules says, and please welcome Smokey Robinson. And then he, he walks out from the curtain and he walks to the microphone and that's the first time that we have seen him. It's the first time you know we have No sound check, nothing. No, no sound check, we didn't, no rehearsal, no hi, how are you doing? Nice to see you. And he comes out and he sings that song and it's really beautiful and Eric does a solo. And um, and at the end of it, he comes over to uh, to me and Eric and he gives us both a hug you know he said oh that, that's beautiful guys thank you thank you so much and we said oh it's our pleasure wonderful and then he just walks off and that was it never saw him again <laughs> <laughs> crazy but the, but the fact that we, we didn't get to rehearse with him is nuts i mean that yeah. never happened before that's never happened before but you know that's the thing with this industry you've got to be prepared for every eventuality you can't think that everything is going to be working out precisely as it is yeah. you know so um so it, it's it's been a it's been a great learning curve for me doing that show and also you have to bear in mind that you're not just dealing with the music side of it you're dealing with personalities you, you know you're dealing with you know there's certain people who are a little bit easier to work with uh, you know some people who are a bit more challenging and and you've got to deal with that and you've got to work out how yeah, how to deal with it, how to deal with those personalities. So it's not just about the music. There's a lot more, there's a lot more stuff going on there. Can you expand a bit about that? It's very interesting, I think, because, you know, when, you, when you're a professional musician, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, 
so-called politics involved and a lot of um, understanding uh, the room. Sure. Uh, can, can you tell a bit more about that? Like, what did you learn? How, how do you think it's best to navigate sure. um, the situations well, and stuff? <clears throat> well, the thing is, I was lucky because I've, I've always done a lot of varied things. Uh, and that's, that's come about because I play a few, quite a few instruments, like brass and stringed instruments. So I've found myself in, in so many different musical settings with, with, with people from, you know, like I said, different cultures, different countries, different areas of the UK, different social settings, whatever. And I've taken away something from all of those. You know, I've remembered situations where dealing with someone that was, that was a little bit kind of tricky or, uh, or, or people who are nervous or people who are cocky or, you know, and, and, you, and, and it's all about experience. You know, sometimes you just have to be out there doing it to, to gain all of this knowledge. But on Jules' show, you are dealing with very famous people. You know, you are dealing with superstars. So it's a bit more tricky with this. I mean, you have to be diplomatic with, with everybody and anybody a lot of the time. But I think you have to be even more diplomatic when you're dealing with, with very famous people. Now, the worst situations are where a very famous artist comes into the studio and they're, they're not overly friendly and they're very demanding. Mm. Uh, and, and in some cases, they'll do something which you know is wrong, but they, they won't accept that what they're doing is wrong. You know, they think they blame they, it on, on the band. <laughs> yeah, or, or or they'll say to the band potentially, or oh, you guys are not listening, or that's not what I said, that's mm -hmm. not what I wanted. And you're listening to this and you're thinking, Well, that's not that's not true. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But then you can't say that. You can't say that to, to the people because at the end of the day, you know, we are session musicians, you know, we we are not you know, these people are the stars kind of thing, you know, so, so really what you have to do is, you know, a lot of the time you just have to bite your tongue and you have to accept your position and, and who you are and, and you just have to adapt, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of things you can't change about other people, but you can change things about yourself, uh, you know, so yeah, there have been times when, you know, I've been really shocked at some things that were said. I mean, nothing ever really horrible, you know, nothing ever very derogatory. But, you know, if, if an artist has, has, has made a mistake and they are not acknowledging that, and you know as a musician that they've made the mistake and you've play, you're playing it right, but there's a suggestion from them that it's the musician's fault, whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's very tricky, uh, you know, because you, we all have a sense of pride in ourselves but I think you know you, you just have to read the room yeah this is a key thing you have to read the room in every aspect of life and you just have to realize you know who you're dealing with you know do you value your own job <laughs> do you know what I mean? like, or your ego <laughs> yeah yeah you know I, I read a, a great book recently called uh, I think it's called ego is the enemy and I can't remember I heard of the, it. Uh, the author, but it's a very good book. I highly recommend it. Ego's the Enemy. And it's, and it's, it's a book that everybody should read. Uh, As a matter of fact, I think I have it here. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I think, yes. Yeah, it's a great book. And, um, and, and, and it's very good because I think that the thing as well with us musicians is, you know, we... Uh, it's really funny. You've only got to look at social media to see that, uh, that musicians these days, it's not just about playing music, they're not just happy playing music. A lot of people want to be famous and they want to be stars and they want to be entrepreneurs and all this kind of stuff. And for me, uh, you know, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with ambition. I mean, don't, I'm all for, for ambition. But I think it's a very different thing now. Whereas when I was coming out, I was just happy to be playing music for my job. Because my parents both worked in a factory and they were wonderful parents and I missed them dearly. But I'm sure my parents didn't want me to carry on working in a factory like yeah. them. They wanted me to, to do better things, you know. So, but for me, playing music for my job, that for me has always been enough. And the most important thing is, is, is the craft. It, it's doing your job and doing it well, you know. Anything else that's happened, I didn't, do, I didn't become a musician because I wanted to be famous, get on the front covers of magazines, uh, get endorsements, 
you know, adulation, all of this. I, I didn't do it. But I didn't even dream that any of that would be possible. I, I had no idea that could be attainable. For me, it was about the craft. It's about the music, just doing my job, you know. And it still is. It still is, really. But, but yeah, I think, you know, when, when, you're, when you're dealing... And, and the Jules gig is very unique because it's like a conveyor belt of, of, of people. When we do his radio show, we used to do four shows a day. Oh, and wow. each, each show had a, a different guest on there. And completely, oh, wow. one day it could be Gary Newman, Kylie Minogue, uh, Shane McGowan. Um, you, you know, it would just be a, cre you know, Adele, Amy Winehouse, whoever. It would just be crazy. The mix of people and the mix of genres was nuts. There was nothing. It wasn't like a whole day of blues artists and a whole day of pop artists. It was just each show on each day, and we would do a couple of days each week. So not only did you have to be flexible, as in, you know, stylistically, you know, you have to have the right instruments. I mean, for me, it was different, say, if you're the drummer, because you can pretty much do it all in the one kit or guitar. But for me, uh, certain artists, I think, expected to see a double bass. Some expected to see a bass guitar. Uh, and again, I, I played brass on, on some of them, because some of the guests were, were bass players. You know, we yeah. had um, we had Mike. Back Rutherford. to your roots. Yeah, yeah. We we had Mike Rutherford, Tony Visconti, um, uh, uh, Susie Quattro, all these kind of people, and they all wanted to play bass. So I, you know, got my trombone and my tuba out, and I was able to join the horn section. Kind of cool. But um, but yeah, dealing with personalities, it, it's I think it's just something you you become good at. The more you do something, the better you're going to be at doing it. You know. But really, yeah. it's it's always about diplomacy. You know, you can't. Uh, it's different if you're in, in a band with your mates, and if somebody is annoying you or offending you, then of course you should be able to say to someone, you know, don't be like that, don't say that. But if you're a backing musician, if you're a session musician, and you're backing these very very famous, legendary people, you know, you you can't really. You've got to curtail you know, what you, what you say and what you think. So you've got to be very courteous. And the other thing is, is not to be too over-friendly with these people as well. They're not your best mate. You know what I mean? So you can't kind of go up to them and start patting them on the back and giving them a hug and saying, hi, oh, <laughs> nice to meet you, my name's, you know. And some of them are kind of going, what, you know, who the hell is this guy, you know? <laughs> so a lot of the time, I mean, on the radio show, we, we get to hang out with them more. We get to sit and have a cup of tea and a sandwich. On the TV show, it's more we're in place and they come onto the TV floor. So we just wave at them from a distance. You know, we, we don't often get to, yeah. to do that, you know, but it really is to me, it's about experience. It's, it's just about learning about people's personalities or, or, or uh, I mean, some of the artists I work with, I, I, I would Google them if I wasn't familiar with them. I would yeah. Google them the night before. I'm thinking I want to do as much research about these people. You know, you, is, there some, is there certain things they don't like, they don't want to talk about? Is there, is there, do they have any hobbies? You know, and then, and then sometimes you can, you can do that. You can just chat with them. I mean, I always love it when we play with a guest and they're, and they're horror movie fans. Because I'm a big ah. sort of horror monster sci-fi movie fan. So whenever I get to play with someone who, who's into that, it's great. We, we had Metallica on the show, on Jules' show years ago with Lou Reed was singing with them. And, um, and I was chatting with Robert, the bass player, but actually Kirk Hammett, he's a, he's a massive monster horror sci-fi fan. You know? No way. And, when, and I got invited to his horror convention in San Francisco in 2014. He had this big convention all of his own. And I, I got invited over to that. And it was really funny. We barely talked about music at all. We just talked about our love <laughs> of monster, monster movies, you know. So, yeah, but it's, it's really about life experiences, you know, but you've just got to respect people's values, respect the space and that. But it's, you know, it's important just to be clocking the situation. Whoever you're working with, you've, again, I use that term, you've got to read the room. You've got to know, yeah. you, know, how, you know, when not to approach someone, when not to talk to them, when you think yeah. it's okay to do kind of thing. But it, and that just comes from experience. And, and time, you know, that's that's really it. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've had uh, an insane, uh, you know, an insane, ca insane career up until uh, up until now, and hopefully, you know, it will be longer and longer and longer. Um, 
do you <laughs> yeah do you remember any like is there any performance uh, or artist that stick out to you uh, like uh, some of your favorite uh, performances and artists that you played with sure well i i think <clears throat> i mean for me uh i've already mentioned one of them which was that smoky robinson performance i mean that was stunning and, I, and i've always been, been pretty cool <laughs> yeah i've been a massive and it wasn't just playing with him it was playing with I've got Eric Clapton sitting next to me as well, you know, so that was pretty special. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I always say some of my favorites are the people that I had all their albums. You know, and I still have all my vinyl. So the people I got to play with that for me were super special. One was definitely George Benson. He came on George's TV show. This is way back. This was early on, like maybe 1993 or 94 or something like that. Uh, and we did that song on Broadway uh, mm -hmm. with him, eh? and he, he he sings and plays guitar and does a great solo scat solo thing. And uh, I mean that was pretty cool because he was a big hero of mine. The other guy um, who less people have heard of is the guy called Al Jarreau, uh, an American uh, sort of jazz. I know Al Jarreau. Singer, you know, I, yeah. But a lot of people, you know, you mention his name, and he's not quite a uh, yeah. household as, as certain people. You know. So I was a massive, massive fan of his. And I got to play with him on Jules' radio show and the TV show. In fact, I bought all my albums along, my Al Jarreau albums. I just couldn't help it. I had to be a fanboy. I just couldn't yeah. stop myself. <laughs> and, uh, and he signed all the albums for me. Uh, a bit wow. personalized. You know, he put two days. There was one of them that was a, an early album from 1981. And he put, uh, he put today, you know, you do realize this has to be back at the museum before 4.30 <laughs> Um, and you know another one he wrote thanks for listening just a really lovely guy but 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 i his his recordings were like the soundtrack to my life throughout the 1980s yeah uh you know that's that that's who i listened to like non-stop during that time so for me to actually get to to meet and and work with him was just it was beyond my my comprehension um, I, but also, you know, when you when you play with these people, what's even nicer than actually playing music with them is is realizing how wonderful they are, you know, how decent a human being they are, and and seeing that humility uh, and the appreciation for us as musicians play, playing with them, you know, it's it's quite a it's quite a thing. And the other one has to be Shaka Khan. Again, same thing. I, I grew up listening to Rufus and Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan albums. I'm a big Anthony Jackson fan. Anthony's my, he's probably my favorite living bass guitarist. Uh, you know, and it's often why I play six string bass because Anthony invented the modern day six string bass. And he played on a lot of Shaka Khan stuff as well as loads of other uh, recordings. So playing with her and getting to play Ain't Nobody, I'm Every Woman, and all this kind of stuff was just, Again, you almost can't believe this this is happening. I do yeah. remember the first time I played with her, those songs, and Jules wanted me to play double bass on them. And I said, Jules, I, you know, this is going to be impossible, man. These, these songs were played on either a keyboard or bass guitars. They definitely weren't played on a double yeah. bass. <laughs> Not on a double bass. He, he, yeah, well, he prefers me to play double bass more than anything else. And I said to Jules, I said, listen, you know, there's some things that are just not it's not yeah. going to happen, you know. So luckily I managed to convince him to let me do that. Um, yeah. The other one, I guess, was Paul Simon. You know, uh, I, I, my brothers were big Simon and Garfunkel fans when I was a kid, so I listened to their albums. And I loved, the, I loved them both, but particularly Paul Simon. And uh, when I got called up to, to play with him on Jules' TV show, <clears throat> I think this was like 2016, I think it was, I was thrilled. But I just assumed that what I was going to be playing it was just going to be a regular bass part, nothing special, in the background as usual, stand at the back. And then I've got the recording. And these days, you know, they send them via the computer. You know, the, the days of CDs are long gone. It's all... Yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> and then We transfer in Dropbox. <laughs> yeah, exactly that, yeah. Um, but it was a song called Wristband. And I put it on, and it basically, it's, it's, a, it's a voice and, and bass duet. No way. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big, massive bass feature in the song. So anyway, I thought, wow, this has never happened before on the show. Everything I've had to play has always been not 
so so obvious, you know, so base featured. So anyway, and I'm you know it's in the key of E flat, and I'm playing this thing, and I'm thinking, oh man, this this fingering's really tricky. I, I'm trying to work out good fingerings for it, and it's just not it's not sitting under my hands very well. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. and I wonder what the guy on the record did because I'm learning his bass part. You know, anyway. We get to the TV studio, Paul Simon's there, and I go and stand at the back, and the, and the producer said, no, 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 come, come to the front. And she put me right next to Paul, just standing next to me. And the thing is, I mean, I'm quite tall. I'm like six foot three, and Paul Simon's probably a foot shorter than I am. So it was kind of, it was kind of quite strange, because the, the cameras are trying to get us both in the shot. But yeah. because of the height differential, <laughs> you could see the cameraman <laughs> But anyway, Paul was great. He, I had a lovely chat with him. His dad used to be a double bass player. He was really friendly, super guy. But he, like I said, it was a big voice and bass feature. And that's on YouTube now. That's, that's actually out there. It's called Wristband. The funny thing <laughs> is, though, we, we did it and he shook my hand afterwards and that's captured on film. He's thanking me. But years later, the bass player that played on the album, this guy called Carlos Henriquez, he contacted me and, and he was talking about my performance. You know, he said, well done. And I said, yeah, Carl. I said, what? E flat. I said, the fingerings were terrible. I said, I couldn't find it. He said, it's not in E flat. It's not in uh, E flat. I said, what do you mean? He said, we recorded it in D. No way. And then slowed down. Well, no, what, what happened is Paul, Paul wanted it faster. Uh. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he wanted, so they sped up the track, so it went from D to E flat. Crazy. So they played in D. So that's why it doesn't work then. Yeah, yeah. And so, and, and, then, and then I picked up the bass while I was typing with him, and I picked up my double bass, and I started to play this song wristband in the, in the key of D, and I'm thinking, oh, it was just... That's so how it cool. is. There was <laughs> open strings everywhere. It was as yeah. easy as could be, you know. But because they they sped the track up, I got I had to play an E flat, and and, yeah. and and I said that explains it, you know. So the Crazy mystery stuff. was off. The mystery was off. But anyway, yeah. the, apart from that, you know, playing with Paul was great. And again, the, these are all people that I grew up listening to. I had their albums. I watched them on TV. So to get to play with with those kind of people. Because, you know, when I when I was younger, I, you know, I was listening to a lot of things like Earth, Wind and Fire, Cool and the Gang. Mm. Uh, you know, like jazz funk, uh, funk stuff. You know, so so obviously that they, they were all those were key people. I mean, if you if you ask different people in the band, they they probably give you completely different answers. If you asked our guitarist, he would say, oh, "Working with BB King, working with Dave Gilmour, working with Jeff Beck." And don't get me wrong, I love working with those guys as well. But Calling like, Eric Clapton as a dep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. <laughs> but for me, it was my heroes the ones that I, um, you know, that I was listening to in my yeah. childhood, in my youth. You know, so that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, I, I think after this many years, you probably don't get it anymore. But were you ever nervous when you were starting to play with these uh, with these celebrities on TV uh, at the start, or do you still get nowadays a little bit of tingling sometimes? Um, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. It, it was it was less to do it was less to do with playing with them. It was it was the environment. I think it's it's because because obviously on on a gig. None of us want to make mistakes. We all want to be as prepared as possible. We want to give the best performance. But you know, if you're on a gig and you you drop a beat or you you miss a note or you play a note out of tune, it's not the end of the world because it usually it's gone by very quickly. Yeah. So I I, I never on on gigs I never think about. It. I, I don't get nervous or, or anxious or anything like that. You know, the only thing that makes me nervous or anxious is if the, any musicians that I'm working with have not done their homework uh, you know, okay. so if, they, if, they, if they've come unprepared and if they're nervous or anxious or they're pacing around like a caged beast with all the gear <laughs> that then that has an effect on me you know not so much not so much playing with someone really famous it's it's the guys in the band that i'm playing with if they <laughs> if they have not prepared and they haven't done yeah. their homework that's what makes me uneasy but um but yeah i, I think it was more I think that a TV show is always going to be more pressurized. It's always going to be more pressurized. And especially if you're, if you say the New Year's Eve show, when you're playing 
there's a lot of musicians and there's a lot of artists. You're paying for like 10, 10 different artists, like one after the other. And the thing is, if you make a mistake, if you as an individual make a mistake on that TV show, then that's mm -hmm. captured forever. Yeah. <laughs> it's there forever for everyone yeah. to hear. <laughs> Somebody's watching that clip in like 50 years time. It's like, ah, I heard that. I heard that. <laughs> so, so that does create a, a, a situation. You know, I mean, I wouldn't sort of say, I wouldn't call it being nervous, but I'm, I'm just very aware, you yeah. know, uh, I'm just very aware that, so, so you might not be the most relaxed to environment, you know, it, I, I yeah. may not sort of feel as relaxed as I would do if I was in a jam session, a rehearsal, a gig. Uh, I mean, even on the radio show, when we did the radio shows, because they weren't live. You know, we so we could sort of we could stop if something happened, and we could stop and redo it. I think I so lost your TV name. But... Show, you imagine? <clears throat> excuse me. Welcome back. We had some uh, some tech issues, but uh, all seems resolved now. <laughs> Yeah. It's always going to be the most challenging because it's not just you that's involved in this. It's it's the rest of the band. It's it's the artist. It's the technicians. It's the lighting guys. Yeah. So in other words, um, well, he, here's what they don't like to happen on Jules' TV show. If whoever's making the mistake, number one, it's got to be really bad for them to stop the recording. Because they don't like to do that. They like to do the whole recording. Uh, and then if there's anything that needs to be redone, they, they prefer to do it at the very, very end gotcha. of the day. They don't like to stop and do it as it's happening, I think. <clears throat> so, and also, you know, if, if, you're, if you're filming the, the TV show, because a lot of the stuff, you know, the, the New Year's Eve show is pre-recorded. You know, there's no way we could do it on New Year's Eve, I guess, it's pre-recorded. Yeah. But when they film it, they like to film it in real time, with no stops, like it was really happening. So, <laughs> I think the only reason why I, I would, um, what, what any, any of us would have to say, stop, 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 is if something had blown up, or yeah. something was setting on fire around us, or, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean, or the, the sprinklers in the studio would come on, you know. If you have just like missed a note or, or, or something like that or split a note, whatever, you just, you, you just wouldn't keep going. Because obviously, cause, cause we, cause if, you, if you end up stopping the whole thing, everyone has to reset. The cameraman, the lighting, the sound guys, the artist, it's, it's a big thing to, to reset all of that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, I kind of think that it's uh, like I said, I only get really nervous if, if other, other musicians that I'm working with haven't done their homework and they haven't done their prep and, and I, can, I can hear or I can see that they're panicking or they're struggling. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the only time that I feel uneasy. But assuming everyone's done their homework, it's relaxed. The only thing that, again, you are then aware of is, is anything on TV is going to be captured forever. So, uh, you know, so where, where, whether it's any aspect of your playing, you know, you just have to be, yeah, you just have to be aware that someone is going to see that, you know, and it's always going to be there. Kind of. But for me, it's, it's, so yeah, it's less to do with the, the artist. It, it's not kind of, oh, it's so-and-so. I'm really, not, you know, I, I just don't get that. I, I think it's because we've been doing it for so long, you know, and then you realize yeah. they're just like ordinary people. Obviously, they're famous, but most of the time they're really nice, ordinary people with humility. So, so I don't really get anything like that. It's just more the, the environment, you know, you're just, it's not like if you're recording a track on an album where you can stop and you can redo it or you can do droppings, whatever, on the TV show. You, there, there isn't really, uh, and actually, the, 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 more often than not, when we have to do retakes on the TV, it's less to do with mistakes that any musicians are making. It's more to do with technical stuff. Gotcha. It's more to do with, with the BBC's lighting equipment or whatever. You know, hmm. I'm not saying it's faulty. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like we've just had with the internet connection. There are technical issues. Yeah. But more often than not, we do that. But we, we would never really, it would have to be really monumental to stop in yeah, the middle of recording I it. on TV. It would, you know, otherwise you just, you just keep doing it. And then they assess at the end of it how bad the thing was. If somebody yeah. makes a mistake or if somebody sings the wrong lyrics, they'll look at it and they'll say, how bad, how bad really is it? Is anyone yeah. going to notice kind of thing? So, it's up to them. <laughs> Well, going back to something you said before that uh, there are so many musicians nowadays and the work uh, the workload is shrinking. Um, do you have any advice for uh, younger people who come out of college and uh, start their career or people who are navigating the career? Like anything that comes to mind that could be helpful for uh, for people navigating this professional musician uh, thing? Um, yeah, I would say get a different job. <laughs> Retrain in cybersecurity, right? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Now, I, the thing is, I, as I said, I, I never wanted to be a musician when, when I was, I, I just loved playing an instrument and it, and it happened by accident. You know, yeah. I, I ended up just, my trombone teacher got me gigs and I didn't think that was possible. So, um, but again, I was lucky because to me, from my experience, they just seemed to be a lot more work going back then and there weren't as many musicians like these days the industry is quite saturated uh you know i've never known so many sort of bass players and so many guitarists and that, like, you know they're, 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 it's like more people when i was a kid nobody wanted to play an instrument nobody everyone hated music when i was a kid no one wanted to play an instrument no one wanted to sing in the choir no one wanted to be do drama all that stuff and like now everybody wants to do that Everyone wants to play an instrument, everyone does play an instrument, everyone wants to be famous on TV, blah, 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 blah. But I think, um, I mean, really, if, if, if it's that, if it's your passion, if, if, if playing music is, is your passion and, you, and you, you can't imagine doing anything else, then you have to follow that. You know, you can't just say, oh, you know, there's no, it's really tough out there, I'm not going to bother, you know, you... I use the term, you have to follow your bliss. And if your <laughs> bliss is creating music, and that's what you want to do as your job, you have, to, you have to do everything in your power to make it happen. I just think it's more, well, it's more challenging in the fact that there's more musicians and there's potentially less work. Uh, you know, but at the same time, modern day musicians, younger people have the, the internet, which I didn't have when I was a kid. So you can... So when I was getting gigs when I was younger, it was word of mouth. You had to do some gigs and hope that somebody that you were working with was going to remember you and recommend you. Whereas now you can just put a video of yourself doing whatever on, on, uh, online and everyone gets to see what you can do. So you're getting this amazing coverage. The problem is everyone's doing it. Yeah. Everyone's exactly. putting that video out there, kind of going, look at me, look at me. <laughs> Am I fantastic? You know? um, and, and again, it, it, it's saturated. You know? So, I mean, here's something that I, there's certain things that I still recommend people uh, doing, especially if they've, if they've just come to London. I still recommend you know, going to see as many gigs as you can and, and try and meet either the people that are playing on those gigs or, or mm -hmm. meet other musicians in the audience, because that's what you've got to do. You've got to get to know people. People need to know who you are and, and what you do. Um, and the usual thing like jam sessions and stuff like that. I mean, I, I didn't go to those when I came to London, because luckily I got work pretty much straight away, uh, you know, with, with reputation kind of thing. So I, I didn't really attend jam sessions, but I think, assuming they still exist, I'm assuming they're... they're <laughs> Uh, you know, I think not many. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think they're still a good thing to go to. But you know, but you have to be careful if you if you go to gigs and say there's people playing that you admire and you want to get to know. You have to be careful sometimes that uh, you know after a show they might be tired, they might have their partners with them, they might just want to hang out with their bandmates. And if and if you if you if someone comes up. And you're kind of going, oh hi, you know, my name's so and so, so and so. You know, I want, I've, I've just arrived in town. I want some gigs. I want some work. It's pro it may not go down too well. Yeah, <laughs> it may not appreciate. Um, and it's the same with cold calling as well. You know, if you just call, if you get someone's phone number and you call them up and, and 
you don't know them and they say you know have you got any work you know it's just not there's certain things that you you can't really do and that are not gonna are not gonna work out well for you but <clears throat> one thing that I did when I came to London which I think is still relevant now I sought out certain key players that I wanted to study with now I wasn't thinking of, of doing this as a networking thing I, I wanted to study with them I wanted to learn either something about technique or something about music, something about improvisation. It was all just to do with the craft itself. Yeah. But what I realized, what started to happen is, the more people I, I studied with, or certain key people I studied with, would, would remember me and recommend me for work. Because they have, not only have they heard me, they've seen and heard me play, so they know my capabilities to some extent. They know if I've got good intonation or playing time, whatever. But also, more importantly, they've spent an hour with you in their home or at yeah. studio. So they've spent an hour in your company. So they're getting to know your personality and how you how you are, how you react. <clears throat> and so, and I think that's a that's a, a really important thing. So the way the way I look at it is when you have a when I had those lessons. It was a lesson, but also it's kind of an audition. Hmm. It's like a paid audition with these kind of... Now, I'm not sort of saying that every teacher is going to be in a position to get you gigs or recommend you. But the thing is, to me, it's, it's, still, a, it's still an option. And it, it worked for me. Like, virtually all the people that I studied with, whether I was studying harmony with someone, whether I was studying double bass or whatever... Virtually everyone I had a lesson with at some point recommended me for work. Wow. You know what I mean? Because this is all pre-internet, pre-social media. So they hadn't seen me on a gig, and they hadn't, I hadn't gone out for dinner with them, I hadn't gone to the pub, I wasn't an old friend. But just that hour in my company and listening to me talk and interact and seeing what I could do, that was enough for some of these people to, to actually yeah. recommend me for gigs. Uh, and, and that's... That to me, I think, is still relevant today. So, <clears throat> so think of it less as a, as a as a lesson, but more as like an audition. And the good thing is <laughs> that that musician is getting paid. Yeah, so it's, it's a mutually <laughs> beneficial thing. They're getting some money for an for an hour, so they're happy, and you're 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 getting them to see what you can do, but also what you are like. And, if, and the thing is, in this industry, I think there are probably a lot of great players out there, like amazing players, but their personalities might leave a little bit to be desired. You know, yeah. they might be very egotistical, um, they might just not be good company, they might not have a great sense of humor. You know, are, are all these things that are irrelevant, uh, you know, the, these, these are important things to do. You know, you, you have to be so much more than a good musician. You just have to be a nice, person to be around yeah. and let's face it you you know this when you're on tour you're spending more time with people just traveling or, or eating or socializing than you are on stage the time on stage yeah. is this is the smallest amount of time that you're spending with them, you know? but really you know you, you want to be someone who is very personable and just pleasant to be you don't have to be the life and soul of the party in fact when I was kind of younger, there were a lot more personalities, people having lots to drink and being, you know, the, the class clown kind of thing. And people like band leaders and organizations, they don't really want that anymore. They, they don't want people who, who like to drink too much, who like to party too much, you know. They, they yeah. like guys to be a bit more, um, uh, you know, together and to be a, a lot more conscientious, you know. So, so I, I kind of think that's a, a thing. You know, it's great to have the exposure you get from social media. But again, everyone's doing it. Everyone's doing the, doing the same thing, you know. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I could put a video on social media of me playing with, um, you know, Jeff Beck on guitar or, or, or something like that, you know. But somebody will, will um, you know, po post a picture of their breakfast or, or, or a, a video of them eating their breakfast. And, it, and, and that will get like, thousands of likes and my, my clip <laughs> to Eric Clapton will get kind of a hundred or something. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> oh, you know, this is what you're up against, you know, people just, 
people want to just see weird, wacky things. They don't always want to see, you know, what what you're up to and what your achievements are, kind of thing. You know. But thank I'm, you for uh, for oh, being here you. today and for your time, man. <laughs> so until next time. Yeah. <laughs> Until next time, have a good one and uh, I'll see you very soon. All right, take care. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.